Bible study hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Back in our Father's Word, our Father is dressing down the nations now, and this is hinging on the day of vengeance, meaning right at the end. So you want to pay, pay close attention. Many of these things happen historically, but some of them are strictly just almost futurist. And that's kind of the way the chapter is today. It has to do with the future as much as the history. And it has to do with Gaza. And uh, so it is with all the trouble we have in Gaza today, you would take heed if you were wise and listen carefully. Chapter 47, verse 1, that word of wisdom from her father, it reads, The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Philistines. That, that's the migratory ones, the vagabonds. I think you can remember from the fourth chapter of Genesis who the vagabonds are. Uh, and they were mixed, intermixed there pretty strongly. Before that, Pharaoh smote Gaza. And, of course, Gaza then is the same as Gaza today. The, and um, with um, the Hamas and many others, um, Abbas and others uh, working in that area. Verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, waters rise up out of the north and shall be an overflowing flood and shall overflow the land. And all that is therein the city, and them that dwell therein, then, then the men shall cry, and all the inhabitants of the land shall howl. And of course, this is looking forward to the coming of the king of Babylon. You know, uh, again, I told you, Josephus mentions this in passing in the tenth, book 10 of the Antiquities. Biblically, it isn't written what happens here, but as far as the king of Babylon going all the way in, as it states here. But the king of Babylon in the end time shall. That's why I want you to take a close look at it. He's going everywhere. Verse 3, And the noise of the stamping of the hooves of his strong horses, at the rushing of his chariots, and at the rumbling of his wheels, the fathers shall not look back to their children, for feebleness of hands. They will be helpless to even help their own children. And that's what Father says. And you know, in the end time when the false one comes, they won't. They can't help their children because they're deceived also. They will all think that the false is the true Christ. And that leads them right down uh, Primrose, Primrose Lane. They're helpless to help their own children because they're ignorant of God's truth. Verse 4. Because of the day that cometh to spoil all the Philistines and to cut off Tyrus and Zidon, this was uh, Tyrus is the main camp of the Kenites, okay? A great trade center. Zidon, uh, Tyrus, of course, means rock, not our rock. Every helper that remaineth for the Lord will spoil the Philistines the remnant of the country of Captor. Uh, scholars have a great difference of opinion on Captor. I think it's Creek, and uh, that, that would be where a part of these came from. Verse 5, Baldness is come upon Gaza. Ashkelon, which is right down the road a little piece there, the rolling one, is cut off with the remnant of their valley, how long wilt thou cut thyself? In other words, cut thyself how? With the sword of the Lord. How long will you disobey God and end up being cut by the, the truth? Because as it is written in First Corinthians, Revelation chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, Christ's tongue is a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. 
how long will you continue going against Almighty God and cutting yourself um, and, and actually cutting yourself off? Um, it's um, amazing. Next verse we go. Um, verse 6. O thou sword of the Lord, how long will it be ere thou be quiet? Put up thyself up unto thy scalpel, rest, and be still. Well, according, according to the great psalm of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 32, uh, verse um, along about 41 and 42, we find out that uh, doesn't happen until it's over. When our Father comes with the vials, uh, he will see that it is done one and for all times. Verse 7, how can it be quiet seeing the Lord hath given it a charge against Ascalon, the rolling one, the miratory one, and against the seashore, there hath he appointed it. It's the appointed time, the appointed day, and the appointed time of Almighty God. You know, with the stirring and the swarming, and the events happening, especially when you affix this 47th chapter to and next to the parable of the fig tree, which has to do with uh, Jerusalem, with Israel, and you see what's going on here, then it should get your attention. Is God still cutting? Well, yes, he is. There's much wickedness in the world um, when, and done really in the name of religion. And with that, many people cut themselves. Chapter 48, and this will have to do with Moab. Let's understand a little bit about Moab before we get into it. Especially in as much as Ruth, the Moabitess, is in the lineage of Christ. You're going to find that God cut off all Moabite males, not female. For a very special reason, when, when Israel was... Uh, coming out of captivity, they refused, their own cousins refused them passage through their land. God has never forgiven them for that. So then we go, chapter 48, verse 1. Against Moab, not for, against, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, woe unto Nebo. And um, that means prophet, okay? And that's where Moses died, as a matter of fact. Um, or or uh, let me rephrase it. That's where God took Moses. Uh, <clears throat> for it is spoiled. Uh, Kairathiam, that's to say the twin cities, two cities, is confounded and taken. Misgab, that's the high fort, is confounded and dismayed. And so it is. Verse 2, there shall be no more praise of Moab. He's not famous, not going to be, not useful to God. In Heshbon, uh, they have uh, devised evil against it. Come and let us cut it off from being a nation. Also, thou shalt be cut down, O madman, the sword shall pursue thee. This word madman in the Hebrew is dung. It's dung hill to be more complete. Uh, it kind of lets you know what Father thinks of them. And, and so it is. Uh, they had, every, had no reason whatsoever to object to the Israelites crossing their land. And yet they would disallow it. And certainly with false religion, false worship, turning their backs on God when they were of the uh, Adamic seed, uh, God disapproved highly. But yet it has nothing to do with the female Moabitess. Uh, verse 3. A voice of crying shall be from Horonim, and uh, the, uh, that uh, shall be from Horonim, spoiling, and great destruction. That means the two caverns or two caves. For what? It's not a cathedral. It's where you go hide away and do a little worship of first one thing and then the other. 
but certainly not worshiping Almighty God. Verse 4. Moab is destroyed. Her little ones have caused a cry to be heard. And, and certainly so it is. Verse 5. For in the going up of Luhith, uh, continual weeping shall go up. For in the going down of Hort and them, the, the enemies have heard a cry of destruction. Um, so you can't have false balances, false religion, without it causing weeping. It's going to happen every time, and certainly, why? There's no blessings from God there. You know, a family in this end time without God is in a heap of hurt. I, I really have difficulty understanding how somebody could make it in the trying times in the world, with world news as it is, as we see the swarmings, to not know our Father and to know He has a plan, and that plan is coming to pass as it's written, then certainly um, uh, one would be in a heap of hurt. Verse 6, flee, save your lives, uh, save your souls. And be like the heath in the wilderness. Well, what, what is the heath? The heath is a little bush that it grows, but it's in the desert, and every the wild goats and everything come along, and they crop off everything it ever puts on. It never amounts to a whole lot of anything because um, it just um, is it, the goats stripping it. And certainly when you're in false religion, that's what happens to your family. You're stripped of the true blessings of the living God. Verse 7. For because thou hast trusted in thy works and in thy treasures, thou shalt also be taken. And Kimish, Kimash, that's their uh, subduer, their type of religion, shall go forth into captivity with his priest and his princes together. They're, they're not going to make it. It's false religion. <clears throat> and our father, uh, he, he won't allow it. Okay, He's jealous. And I want you to note one thing. Because you, they trusted in their works, not in God, not in the true father, but they trusted in man. And in their own works, you're going nowhere there. Father will not bless it. He will not adhere to it. And certainly you're on a, you're on a, a downstream push without a paddle. You're gone. Verse 8. And a spoiler, that's one of Satan's names, and that's why you must affix this to the end times as the false Christ, shall come upon every city, not just part of them, every city, and no city shall escape. The valley also shall perish, and the plain shall be destroyed, as the Lord has spoken. Uh, he ordered it, God ordered it, and when God orders something, you can rest assured that's exactly how it's going down. Satan will cause many spiritual deaths, because they will believe upon him. They're ignorant of God's word. You study Kamish. Uh, Chemish and uh, false religions and trust in men and their works of what they make, a whittle out an idol, <clears throat> instead of worshiping the living God, you're just in a heap of hurt. And so are they. How difficult life even today is without our Heavenly Father and His blessings. Verse 9, give wings unto Moab, I mean, rapture right out of there, let her fly away. That it may flee and get away, for the cities thereof shall be desolate without any to dwell therein. Unfortunately, fleeing away on the wings, uh, God, that's not his way of um, conquering. You have to make a stand. And you have to make a stand against the spoiler. As it's written in Mark chapter 13, you're going to stand against him, and the Holy Spirit's going to speak through you. We're in that generation, the generation of the fig tree, and you need to pay very strict attention 
to the nations and God's pronouncement upon them. For as it is written, so it shall come to pass. Verse 10. Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. And curseth be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. That is to say, this, what is that sword? It's the truth. It's Christ's word. If you do not plant those seeds, if you do not push that word forward, then uh, that's not too good. But curse, most of all, is for those that would teach deceitfully, like to fly away with the wings. <clears throat> and part of Kamish, uh, it'll end you up in a bad place. God didn't teach it, didn't even enter his mind. He says in, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 13, I'm against it, those that teach my children to fly to save their souls. I will have no part of it. Verse 11. Moab hath been at ease from his youth, and he hath settled on his lees, and hath not been emptied from vessel to vessel, neither hath he gone into captivity, therefore his taste remaineth in him, and his scent is not changed. This, this has a great play on winemaking. And when, when wine sets on its lees, the older it gets, the better it gets, but the lees also bring forth uh, the uh, junk, impurities, and so forth. When you pour off the good and take out the sed settlement, segments uh, to that... Um, corrupt it, but what it says, he's never been to war, he's never been tested, <clears throat> and all he does is goes with, uh, with peace, 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 of uh, worshiping this, that, and the other, until actually, if something isn't tried, if it isn't practiced, it becomes good for nothing. But what it says, it's a, a play on the mind, wine work, working. Uh, nobody's ever bothered him, and he's kind of growing a little sluggish out of the whole affair. Verse 12, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send unto him wonders that shall cause him to wonder, and shall empty his vessels and break their bottles. This, this word, wonders, is tilters. I mean, they're, they're going to tilt his bottle. They're going to pour out everything he's got. They're going to strip him bare. And uh, his, his wine and his good times are gone. Good time, Charlie, it's all over with. Well, now, who, who, who's going to do that? Thus, thus saith the Lord. Verse 13. And Moab shall be ashamed of Chemish. And, <coughs> excuse me, and the house of Israel was as it was ashamed of Bethel and uh, of their confidence. And certainly so it was when it went bad and so when Chemish goes bad, it doesn't respond to them. They're in a heap of hurt. Verse 14. How say ye? We are mighty and strong men for the war. Uh, how can you boast about that? You, you've never practiced. You've never done anything. You've never been tried. You've never been tested. 13, 15, Moab is spoiled and gone up and out of her cities. And his chosen young men, the very flower of his youth is mowed down, are gone down to the slaughter saith the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Uh, that's the way it's going to come to pass. 16, the calamity of Moab is near to come, and his afflictions hasten it fast. In other words, uh, it slips into one worldism, and he ceases being a nation. It's going to happen on that day of vengeance. 17, all ye that are about him, bemoan him. And all ye that know his uh, name say, How is the strong staff broken 
and the beautiful rod. How, how did all this go up into nothing? Because it was fit for nothing. But for the Christian, what does it really mean? What, what was lacking? God's presence. They whittled out their own religion in caves. They worshiped their own works, meaning what they whittled out to call a God. And you certainly would not expect God to bless that. He never would. Our Father is a jealous God, and if you serve him, you're in pretty good shape. You refuse to serve him, sorry, you're going to have a rough old ride. Verse 18, Thou daughter that dost inhabit Diban, the, the, the wasting, come down from thy glory and sit in thirst. For the spoiler, that's the Antichrist, of Moab shall come upon thee and he shall destroy thy strongholds. But with what? Peaceful prosperity and lies. This is why God would say earlier in verse 10, Cursed be those that um, doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. That means lying to the people. Give, teaching false salvation and um, taking the people away from God's um, help instead of to it. Verse 19, O inhabitant of Aurora, that, that's to say the ruins, Stand by the way and a spy. Now look around you and ask him that fleeth and her that escapeth and say, what is done? What is happening here? Verse 20. Moab is confounded for it is broken down. Howl and cry and tell ye it in Arnon and the, the roaring river that Moab is spo uh, spoiled, and so he is. Well, you might say, well, did God spoil him? No, he spoiled himself. He betrayed his own brothers by not allowing them safe passage, and then worshiping everything under the sun but what he's supposed to, our Heavenly Father. And this lets you know there comes a time that father has had it. But at the same time, out of this family of Moab, which means of his own father, being Lot, uh, Lot being that father by one of his own daughters when um, they felt that all people had died and at Sodom and Gomorrah. But the daughter, which Ruth was one in the very lineage of Christ, uh, it, has, it does not apply to the m female, but to the male of that particular tribe. Verse 21. And judgment is come upon the plain country, upon, upon Horlon, and upon Jehaza, uh, that's, that's to say um, the trodden, and upon Meth. Uh, um, that's to say the splendor of it, uh, only there's nothing splendor there any longer. What is judgment? It's God's judgment. God, we have one judge. And when you don't obey him, guess what your verdict is going to be? This holds true to you today. You have one judge. If you snuff at him, if you turn your back on him, if you mock him, and he is the only judge, guess what's going to happen to you? That's what's happening to Moab. Uh, God won't tolerate it. That's the point. Verse 22. And upon Dibon, and upon Nebo, and upon Beth um, Diblathiam, that's, that's to say the, the uh, house of fig cakes, okay? Should remind you of the parable of the fig tree, to, as I've stated earlier, lying with that 47th chapter. <clears throat> that's, that's the way it goes, 23. And upon Kyrathiam, and uh, that being the twin cities, and upon Beth Gamal, 
And Beth, of course, is house, and Gamel is camel, who almost translates into English as it is. And upon Beth Mion, which is Bel Mion, which is Bel worship, was there. Wasn't anything good going on there? 24. And upon Karoth, that's to say the city builders, and upon Basra, and upon all the cities of the land of Moab, far and near. I mean, when, when the males are in that way, that's exactly the way she goes down. 25. The horn of Moab, which you might say the strength of Moab, is cut off, and his arm is broken, saith the Lord. I'm taking it away from him. He doesn't deserve it. He hasn't done anything to get my attention. He's not said one time that he loves me. And God says, I'm, I'm through with it. Verse 26. Make ye him drunken. For he, imagine, he magnifieth himself against the Lord. And he does. Moab also shall wallow in his vomit. And he also shall be in derision. In other words, he's mocked, he's going down an endless path, and the filth and the, and the degradation of the state of his soul is miserable. You can apply that to the flesh, but it's not nearly as serious as it is with his soul. Because flesh is very temporary, but soul should be for an eternity. And unless there's some changes in the millennium, he's going to be hard-pressed to even make. Uh, anything. Verse 27. For was not Israel a derision unto thee? In other words, they wanted to come through and you stopped them. You wouldn't let them. Was he found among thieves? He might as well have been. His own people were act treated him like a bunch of thieves, trying to rob him for going through. For since thou sp uh, spakest of him, thou skippest for joy. You were happily uh, trying to rip him off, big time. First, when he needed your help, 28. O oh, ye that dwell in Moab, leave the cities and dwell in the rock. This is Selah, and um, um, it's kind of like Petra, that's the place of the giants. And be like the dove. And maketh her, that, maketh her nest in the sides of the hole's mouth, right, right in the mouth of the cave. Go ahead if you want to do that. 29. We have heard the pride of Moab. He is exceedingly proud. That was what caused Satan's downfall. Remember Ezekiel 28? His loftiness and his arrogance and his pride and the haughtiness of his heart. And so it is that um, that haughtiness and pride it does you in. Well, what does it? Why would uh, arrogance and haughtiness do that? What you think you know more than God? And anytime you come to a place that you think you know more than God, you are in a you're on a dangerous cliff, and you're about to take a step that's going to take you into the abyss. Because our Father, what is wisdom and knowledge? Is loving Him and listening to His teachings. That is true wisdom. You turn away from Him, what's, what is left? Nothing. Verse 30. I know His wrath, saith the Lord, but it shall not be so. His lies shall not so affect it. He's going nowhere. His lies won't, why won't they stand? Because they're a bunch of lies. This is why when you're studying God's word, God wrote you this letter, sending you the truth of exactly how it's going down. And if you can let some man entice you to believe something different, you should be deceived. Always listen to your father's word and, um, and be blessed. It's much better to be blessed than to be cursed. Verse 31, Therefore will I howl for Moab, and I will cry out for all Moab. Mine heart shall mourn for the men of Kerhiras. Um, um, and so it is that um, 
there's nothing fragrant about it. And uh, it is a sad black fortress that is no good. Verse 32, O vine of Sibma, that's to say, um, uh, from its very resting place and pla its place, I will weep for thee with the weeping of Jazer. And thy plants are gone over the sea. They reach even to the sea of Jazer. The spoiler is fallen upon thy summer fruits and upon thy vintage. In other words, that wine's not going to do you any good. The spoiler's got it. The spoiler, of course, is Antichrist. You know, I know that many people have trouble with this because Antichrist is not taught. Not taught in a positive sense, but taught in a way that you know you must stand against him. Why? He comes at the sixth trump, and the true Christ doesn't return until the seventh. But God sent the Comforter for a very special reason, to strengthen you, to protect you, to guide you, to lead you, where you have nothing to worry about. He cannot, as it is written in Luke 21, harm a hair on your head. So you can stay with Father, and if people want to go to their little caverns and their little caves and lose themselves whittling out different religions and uh, new ways of worship, then let them go. But you stick with what our Father gives us. Stick with the Word of God. Verse 33 to complete. And joy and gladness is taken from the plentiful field and from the land of Moab, and I have caused wine to fail from the wine presses. None shall tread with shouting. Their shouting shall be no shouting. They're not going to have anything to shout about any longer. Why? God intends to end it, and so it is. Uh, Moab did a bad thing, and God gave that reason to you back in the 27th verse. And that's not good to turn on your own. Not good at all. All right, we'll pick it up here in the next lecture. These things have to do with the end times. You want to pay very close attention. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible is an invaluable tool to the serious Bible student. The Strong's Concordance lists every word used in the Bible and every passage where the word utilized may be found in the scriptures. With the assistance of a reference numbering system, the English reader may easily translate any word back to the original Hebrew, Chaldea, or Greek in which God's word was written. The Companion Bible is a unique study Bible. In addition to the text of the King James Version Bible, an extra wide margin contains a wealth of information not found in other Bibles. A system of structures or outlines employed by the Companion Bible will allow the readers to rightly divide the Bible. The use of these structures help the reader follow the subject matter, and therefore they are critical to an understanding of God's Word. The 198 appendixes found in the Bible cover a wide variety of topics and information which will enlighten your studies. The Companion Bible and Strongest Concordance are a must for the serious Bible student. And there we are. Back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We will not judge people. We have one judge, that's our Father. He can handle it. We do have spiritual discernment, which is to say, be able to divide rightfully what is correct and what isn't. How much better Moab would have been had they used that discretion of spiritual, um, that gift from God of discernment. But they didn't. They didn't refuse to use it, and guess what happened? So always listen to him, follow him, and be blessed. It sure beats being cursed. Okay, those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you a mailing address. Again, it's always a pleasure. Now, you got a prayer request, you don't need that number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking, and he loves you. Let, let him know that you love him in return. That's what he wants from you, Hosea 6.6. 6. I do not want your burnt offerings. I want your grace. 
Let's just say your love. That he created you for his pleasure. Let him know that you love him. It gives him great pleasure. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Patricia from Arkansas. Please explain what are religious acts. I, I'm going to assume that you're thinking about Revelation chapter 19, verse 8, where it isn't religious acts, it's your righteous acts that weave the linen that forms the clothing you wear in heaven. And uh, righteous acts that weave that fine linen, again from Revelation 19.8, is when, when you plant a seed or when you love the Lord, those are righteous acts. In other, words, in other words, it's doing what is right. And that pleases our Father. It surely does. Okay, Pastor Murray, and this would be Keith from Wisconsin. As time goes on, more and more preachers and politicians are saying that Jesus' teachings are socialistic, even communistic in some cases. What can a person say to respond to these accusations? Well, they're totally and completely false. Christ always taught personal responsibility throughout the Word of God. Everyone is judged by their own individual actions. You can't blame it on somebody else, and you can't blame anything else on anyone else. It is true when, when the when the ministry first started with Christ and the disciples, uh, they did pool their, their uh, finances, as, but they were traveling. They did not have hotels and motels and things in that time that you do today. And uh, that was the way. But our Father expects each one never take a begging bag and always, but always... Uh, teach his word as it is written, or follow his word as it's written, and he'll see to it that all things are blessed. But uh, socialism and communism always drive God and Christ away. That in itself documents it was not so. Why, if they are so far, why, if they are saying God and Christ are socialistic, do the socialists want to drive God and Christianity out of, out of being. You see, uh, a lot of people can, will buy anything because they're ignorant, but God will still not accept that. He sent a letter, and he expects people to read it. With that comes knowledge. And from Florida, my question is this, will the Antichrist control our Social Security and should we re, or should and should we refuse it? What about a small savings account in the bank? Should we pay by gold and silver and hide it under the bed? No, you, you know, I don't like to give fi uh, financial advice because everyone must do as they choose. Never have uh, any part of your savings other than a say small amount of liquidity in silver and gold. That's a very small amount. I would say not even over 5%. And uh, keep the rest of your money in a safe place. And certainly, as far as, as anything that it comes to you that you do not have to worship the Antichrist, take it. But when it comes to the government changing into a one-world system, and then you have to worship him to be a member thereof, that's where you draw the line. That's why you want that small amount of liquidity in that uh, bartering material so you can make it. Charlie from Tennessee. When I was growing up, I've heard from older people that when God returns, he will burst the graves open and raise the dead. Is this true? No, it absolutely is not. We have a God of the living, not of the dead. Okay. There's nobody in those graves. What is in those graves is the flesh that went back to dirt. That beautiful person, you see, has a different body. It's a spiritual body. 
and it has returned to the Father that gave it. Jesus makes that very clear in the closing verses of St. John chapter 8, where he identifies the first murderer and who his father is. Then he continues on and says, Our father is not the God of the dead. Why? Because to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Uh, Ron from California, what is the meaning of Genesis 9:19? These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole world overspread with Ephadim people, not the, not the Gentiles, okay? You, you have to realize uh, this means that every single person of the earth died in that flood. No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that at all. What, what did God tell Noah to take aboard the uh, ark? In Genesis chapter 6, take two of every flesh. He had created all the races on the sixth day. And let, let's take the Kenite as an example. Certainly, as it is written also in Genesis chapter 6, that Noah had the only family that had a perfect pedigree that hadn't intermixed with the Kenites or the fallen angels. So you, you, there could not, even in their wives or their sons, Noah or his wife, would you find a Kenite? But there was two of them aboard the ark. And um, then you can find in First, First uh, Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, the Kenites made it past the flood quite handily. And they were keeping books for Judah even at that time. Okay? You have to rightly divide the word of God. From those would come the lineage through which Christ would come, not the, not the Gentile nations. Uh, Tanya from Tennessee. I, I love your program. Thank you. I watch you every day. My question to you is please explain Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, my next question to you is someone told me I'm not a Christian because I don't go to church. Well, you're, if you're listening to us, you're in church. We are a church. And we're gathering together in the Spirit, uh, regardless of where you are. It doesn't matter. God is with us. Uh, so, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, stipulates uh, the church of Smyrna, which is one of the only churches Christ was pleased with. Yet in Philadelphia, in 310, Revelation and what it meant was is that you're going to be delivered up before the synagogue of Satan when he comes as Antichrist. You don't have to worry. Just allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you. That's what it means. And uh, you, I, I understand your family problem there as I read on um, and uh, keep peace in the family, and you'll do fine. Ask God to handle it for you. Jamel from Mississippi. When you get delivered up before the son of perdition, how do you get to where his, he's going to be at? Uh, he'll see to that. There, remember, he comes in some fantastic vehicles, supernatural powers, and is able to transport people quite rapidly. That will be no problem for him to arrange. Uh, this would be Marie from Texas. My question is, how will people know when Satan comes on earth, when he does come? Please explain. Thank you. Well, he's supernatural. It's going to make headlines everywhere that Christ has returned. And he's doing, he's coming in prosperously and peacefully, and people are loving him. There's just one big problem. It's the sixth trump, and it's not the Christ, it's the false Christ. And don't worry, it'll, be, it'll make headlines everywhere because he is supernatural. He can snap his fingers and lightning come down from heaven. Uh, that uh, gets people's attention. And that's only one of his little tricks. He's got a whole bag full of them performing miracles in the sight of man that will drive him bonkers if you're not educated in the word of God to know he's a fake. Uh, Ed from California, when, if we, or as God's elect, convert a loved one who is on the other side of the gulf during the millennium, 
do we bring them back to the right side with us? Can it be for multiple people or one at a time? What about our good friends? No, you, you're, you're mistaken. All you can do is advise them to get their act together. They have to wait until Satan is released a short season at the end and take part in the second resurrection. God will accept no one without their being tested on their own. You can advise them, but they themselves, when Satan is released in Revelation chapter 20, a short season, will have to make that stand against him. And, uh, and so it is. God doesn't want anybody that's untested. So therefore, they have to wait until that time. But that will be part of your message to them. You either take, there's only two uh, resurrections. There's the first one, and then there's the second one. The second one is at the end of the millennium, and then comes something else that is second. It's called the second death. It's to walk into the lake of fire and be consumed. Uh, Carla, and Carla's from North Carolina. Mom always had all five of us kids in church. However, I rebel most of my life throughout I was told by many that they felt I was destined for great things from Father. Still, I rebelled. I came to trust and love God eight years ago, and I listened to Shepherd's Chapel faithfully. My question is, could I still be one of the elect with all the sins and, and the mess I made for so long? When you repent, it's washed away. That's the beauty of Christianity. You know... <clears throat> Excuse me. This is this is one of the things Paul had problems with. Uh, you talk about a sinner. Paul Paul was uh, standing in Acts chapter seven, holding the coats of the people that murdered Stephen. I mean, he was at war with Christians. Paul was big time. And then God struck him down on the road to Damascus that day in Acts chapter nine, and uh, certainly. Uh, uh, told him, you're one of my chosen vessels, and you will have three-pronged message to the house of Israel, to the Gentiles, and to the kings and queens of the ethnos. And, and so it is. But Paul always, usually in his writings, he would say, of which I am least, because he went against the church so strong. When he was on his road to Damascus, he had a bill of... of uh, a, a legal document in his pocket that give him the right to go to Damascus and destroy the Christian church. Not much has changed over the period of time because Damascus is not a safe place for a Christian to be today. And even in old Egypt, that base nation, they destroy a lot of Christians and a lot of churches. Uh, Yogesh from Georgia, is it possible for the Lord to send someone from the wrong, let's see, actually, I assume he was hallucinating since he was uh, heavily on heart, this is his father, I think, for diabetic medications, less than a month after, later, after this visitation, he passed away, and recently on your question and answer program, you mentioned that it is not unusual for the Lord to send a loved one that has already passed away to comfort someone who is suffering. And is this the transition, as in the transition of dying? My question is, is it possible for the Lord to send someone from the wrong side of the gulf? He probably would not. So if they came there on the right side of the gulf and... And I, if I were you, I'd be very careful about judging which side somebody is on. That's, that's God's business, not ours. Uh, C from Virginia. Uh, okay, let me see if I can find. Does, I'm glad you watched the program. I have been incarcerated 25 years straight from 1987 for a crime I committed, pleaded guilty to and have sought forgiveness for. I repented and accepted Jesus as my Lord. When Jesus was at Calvary Cross, uh, and I see what you're asking, if he, God can forgive. 
you know, even even when he demands capital punishment, he's still, there's a trial coming, and we, we have no right to say what he's going to say, because he's the judge. And certainly, um, he is one that believes in repentance, certainly is, always has, and that's why the son himself died on that cross at Calvary, so that uh, we repentance would apply. Leon from Illinois. Uh, I remember reading somewhere in the Bible, if you do not take care of your parents and family, that you are not better than an infidel. But I do not recall where something to that effect. And my son, who studies the Bible, thinks I lost, I lost it, perhaps. Let me uh, know if I read it. You did. You read it correctly, basically. It's first first Timothy chapter five, verse eight. Somebody a, a man that will not take care of his own family is worse than an infidel. First Timothy chapter five, verse eight. Uh, Donna from Texas. Pastor Murray will when Satan comes at the sixth trump, is that when Michael kicks him out of heaven? Yes, that's why he comes. He's no longer welcome in heaven. Is he then put back in chains until the end of the millennium when God's final judgment takes? He, he's put back into the abyss, and there is a ban placed upon him that he cannot affect anyone spiritually and or otherwise, meaning during the millennium, not even his evil spirit can be present on earth because he is totally, completely secluded to that abyss, that pit. Gordon from Kansas, where do I find the parable of the fig tree? Well, you, you will find it in um, Mark 13. That's one of the good places to find it. You will find the prime root of it uh, in many places, such as Christ wilting the fig tree out of season. In Jeremiah, which we just completed in chapter 24, in Jerusalem, the sign of the fig tree where you would know when the end was was when both a good basket of figs and a bad basket of figs go back and establish the nation Israel. And, and naturally, the fig tree started in the garden itself. Well, how did it start in the garden? Well, that's where Satan seduced Eve and Adam. What did they make? They made aprons out of what? Fig leaves. And to understand the parable of the fig leaf tree, you've got to go all the way back to there, that generation. Christine from uh, from Maryland. My, that, I'm sorry, I was probably Michigan. I, maybe Maine, I'll leave it there. My brother died in an accident. He said he didn't believe, but I believe he, in his heart he did. I wonder... If he's in heaven, I know he read his Bible and had a lot of questions. He was a good man, and I miss him. But well, we're not to judge him. If he read his Bible and he asked questions, his heart was probably right, and he's probably in good shape. And if not, you'll be able to help him in the millennium. But um, from what you have said, I would say don't judge him. He's, I'm sure he's okay. Alice from Montana when Satan is here, when we pray, will we be able to hear, will he be able to hear our prayers? Not unless you pray them out loud. If you pray them out loud, then certainly uh, he will hear them. God hears your prayers whether you say them out loud or silently because he's a cardio knower. But Satan does not have that privilege nor that right. He... Um, must hear you say it. That's why when you're planning something that's extremely important for God, it's really kind of best to keep it under wraps until you've got it nailed down where you know that, um, it's, that it's going to be successful. Or if it's something that will injure him, he will throw every block he possibly can against your actions. So, as the old saying, loose lips sink ships. And certainly, um, when, when you're planning something for God that is especially powerful, 
in meaningful for God, be very careful. Melissa from Arizona. I am so thankful to God for you and your program. Well, thank you. I watch every morning. God bless you. I'm looking forward to using the Strong's Concordance. You'll enjoy it. I look forward to your program, okay? Pastor Murray, how should I go about telling my family? Should I start with Genesis? I would really like to, to um, share what I have learned from God's Word. Thank you for your uh, monthly newsletter. Well, you are so welcome. And uh, <coughs> excuse me. You start by teaching your family by seeds. You plant a little seed, and then if they come to you and ask further questions, answer them. But don't dump the whole thing on them all at one time. Gently and firmly lead on into the truth and plant seeds like, isn't it wonderful to know where America is mentioned in the Bible, the true house of Israel? And isn't it wonderful to know that we have a part, that it, 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 God remembers us and God depends upon us, especially if you are one of his elect. And uh, just gently bring that on to them. They'll love you for it. Uh, and if they don't, then you, they're still family. You love them anyway. And we're out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Makes his day when you read his letter that he sent to you with understanding. And when you make his day, boy, is he going to make yours. Why? He loves you. Return that love. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. But most important, though, one thing real special, listen to me now, you stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're going to talk about why worry again. You know, one of the biggest wastes of time there is is to worry. It, you know what it does? It sets you off center in, in your mental state. It, it really does. It upsets you. It puts you on... It puts you on guard against things you don't need to be on guard about because you're worrying. And the, unfortunately, uh, 